Um, for anybody that hasn't been here before, welcome to uh, Orion Growth uh, in the Open Campus community, which is uh, our metaverse platform powered by Verbella. Um, Dave, our moderator and my co-conspirator and I are, are super happy to uh, host you guys today. Um, John Ramser is here from Orion. Um, he's capturing footage, so feel free to introduce yourself to him. His avatar is the uh, is the cam is the camera. So if you go speak with him, we'll be recording this and we'll publish it up to our YouTube page um, in its full uncensored, uncut version. So um, when we're done, it'll be about 10 minutes after we finish. It'll probably be up um, somewhere in here. There's Sarah. Sarah from Open Campus. She's a VIP of community. She and her team uh, work really hard to get everybody accommodated. So the onboarding process, avatars, downloads, tech issues, general wayfinding, and you know, we're exploring a new modality here. So we're really appreciative of them. Uh, and thanks to Michael uh, for onboarding too, if Michael's around. Um, all right, great. So with that, I'd like to introduce our guests. We've got um, Darcy Mayfield, a revolutionary remote culture architect at Shift with Darcy, Darcy Marie transforms work, or I'm sorry, transforms remote work into a pathway for future living, a celebrated future of work thought leader. She's helped shape thriving remote first cultures at Airbnb, TaxJar, Jasper AI, and Stripe. With her innovation shift, S-H-I-F-T, system and global travel experience, Darcy excels in creating environments where teams thrive, blending digital efficiency with meaningful connections, both inside and outside of work. Welcome, Darcy. Thanks. Stoked to be here. Thank you. Uh, and also, we've got uh, Liam Darmody. He's a hot sauce aficionado and family first man. Um, and he's also the founder of Liam's brand stand in his spare time, of course. He helps individuals <laughs> and teams build magnetic brands that attract clients, talent, and opportunity on LinkedIn. Liam is a fellow North Carolinian hailing from Raleigh Durham, Cha Raleigh Durham, Chapel Hill, probably enjoying the cold, rainy weather today. Uh, prior to starting Liam's brand stand, he spent nearly two decades building and scaling go-to-market strategies at startups and mid-market tech companies. So welcome, Liam. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. So we're excited to have both of you guys here in our metaverse space. Thanks for exploring with us. And uh, with that, I'll uh, toss it to, to Dave. Yeah, thank you guys. Really excited for this one. It's sort of special for me because um, as we were talking about earlier, I was previously a professional online poker player, which is another word for solopreneur. Did not know that at the time. Also didn't know that I was ultimately a remote worker at the time either. And then for the last more than a decade, I've been an office leasing agent. And in part, I've I spent most of that time in the office all the time, but more recently I've I've moved and become a remote first worker again, despite being in the same profession. And in a lot of ways, I'm trying to figure out how to return to my solopreneur days. So this is going to be cool to hear from you guys today. Um, so just to kick it off, I've kind of fallen in love with the phrase progress is a returning to something that we already knew. And often I'm finding that I use is it in reference to you know the intuition that's rooted in our like inner child or maybe even a transcendental lived experience of those who kind of predate us or our parents something that kind of lives within us but today i want to apply that concept to solopreneurship the topic of solopreneurship is like a been a rocket ship since covid particularly on linkedin and i've really been spending a lot of time trying to figure out why this is the case because it's not a new concept you know, in, in the modern context, even in the early days of the internet, we've been able to be digital solopreneurs. I actually know a guy on Prince Edward Island where I live who moved out here once he had a fax machine. So this is not new. And if we go back in human history to, you know, to ancient civilizations like Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, where solo trades were more common than large business, or the rise of personal workshops during the medieval period, or the rise of artists, architects, intellectuals during the Renaissance era, working the way we have been you know working in this way is honestly more common than the more recent sort of like industrial post-industrial way of working you know, so since covid we've actually been sort of rejecting a lot of this and trying to embrace at least the mindset of solopreneurship so that's kind of why i think it's picking up steam at least in a pop culture perspective we've sort of unwired our brains 
at scale and it's causing us to return maybe to something that we already knew. But in times that we live in now are a lot different than these ancient civilizations in the medieval period of the Renaissance. And much like every period in human history, some aspects are better or worse, easier and more challenging. And that's kind of where I want to start with the conversation today. I want to define what it means to be a solopreneur today and how we maybe might look backwards to sort of move forwards. Because speaking personally, I'm kind of a little bit worried about the pedestal we're putting the modern solopreneur on. And I'm hoping we can explore and better understand this movement for the average person, not necessarily the rock star social media perspective. So with that, Darcy, can I get you to kick us off with your perspective of what it means to be a solopreneur today? Yeah, so I've, it's interesting. I've been on kind of the remote work journey since 2014, but I became a solopreneur almost two years ago. And I would say a lot of what I learned in like self mastery of working remotely, like understanding how to manage my energy and not my time has like really supported the journey into like solopreneurship. But I think that if I could like drill it down i think like the beauty of solopreneurship and the balance that i'm always constantly trying to seek is a a an ex like a perfect dotted line between the value of autonomy and the value of belonging and i'll talk a little bit about that like i don't think people realize how much work whether physical or remote provides a sense of belonging for people and a sense of grounding consistency and when you become a solopreneur like that doesn't really exist anymore. You have way more autonomy than you did in a, like an environment where you have to adhere to somebody else's schedule, but that sense of belonging is now gone unless you go out and seek it or move to a community that has a lot of like third spaces or community resources. So I would just say for me, defining solopreneurship is really finding the balance between autonomy and belonging, coming back to your own values, your own compass, and finding that flow state in the zone of genius that you really, are specialized in it fills you up it's that sense of eudaimonia and then also finding people and clients in which align with your core values and your zone of genius so that's a very like long-winded way of describing it but it, to come back to just autonomy and belonging i really like that you started there darcy um again before i pass this over to liam just to sort of transition like it's been I've been on that journey myself, Darcy, even without fully diving into being a solopreneur again by moving from a big city to a small town and being a you know remote worker. Well, it looks like we've lost Darcy. Hopefully she gets back in. Um, but I think that, you know, Liam, as I pass it over to you to maybe kind of build on the same thing, what I'm wondering about that is, you know, we, we had a lot of challenges in the pandemic working remotely, particularly being isolated, you know, without any, without much choice in the matter. And so, but even with that, many people love working remotely, despite some of the challenges around belonging and, and all of that. So how do we bridge to whatever your, your definition of solopreneurship is today? And what, what do you think is maybe also important about what Darcy just said? Yeah, so I'm obviously a little bit earlier on the solopreneurship journey um, than Darcy. She's she's had a lot more experience working in this capacity. Um, so for me, I'm very much figuring out that transition in real time. Um, I think my background, obviously, having worked at startups for my entire career, culture is such an important thing for me. You know, whenever I was talking about accepting a position, I mean, the, the culture and the people that I met and the, and the vibe of the office and the energy um, was something that I really thrived off of. And it's something that's admittedly kind of gone away as I've ventured into launching my own business. Fortunately, you know, I surround myself with people on my actual LinkedIn platform and I have all sorts of people that I talk to on a daily basis. And that kind of fills that void a little bit, um, not quite as effectively, but, but certainly makes it easier when you're having conversations with a ton of people that you respect and, and you think really highly of. Um, I think the definition that Darcy gave makes a lot of sense, right? You have to fi find that right balance and, and what, you know, what that means for you personally. Right. So I think me having a home office is great, uh, but it's, it does get lonely. So I, you know, I will go and I will work, at coffee shops or I will go and work in co-working spaces just to be around other people who are being productive because I think that that is 
probably one of the biggest challenges that you have is that nobody is necessarily making you get anything done, right? You're setting your own deadlines. You're determining how much work you do on a single day, on a single day and, you know, when to stop that work and focus on family and things like that. So uh, I think that being an effective solopreneur is certainly a quest that I'm, I'm obviously trying to figure out myself, but you have to have that balance and you have to know what works right for you personally. There's no single definition. And I think a lot of people, when they hear the term solopreneur, they have this idea of what that means because of what some very popular and prominent solopreneurs on social platforms put put out as sort of the definition. But at the end of the day, you know, you have to adapt it to your own, what fits your own uh, mold, so to speak. Yeah, I dig it. I dig it. And I think like for a lot of people in this pandemic and, and sort of off the back of this pandemic, we've been recognizing that, yeah, we've had social belonging through going to the office, let's say, as our primary mode of interacting with other people. But within that, a lot of people, I think, didn't necessarily feel uh, a felt sense of connection. And they, they still might have actually been lonely among people that they were spending their days with. And for me personally, I've just sort of found that like the whole COVID experience and then deciding to move and being a remote worker it's kind of like broken me down in a lot of ways emotionally, but it's given me this opportunity to build myself back up and create that for myself. And having agency and autonomy is hard, but it's it's really worth it. And it's like it's it's what I think a lot of people want to go on that journey. And I think that's why there are these really, really large social accounts on LinkedIn, you know, about preaching it. And if I could just call one guy out and get maybe just an, it's not to call out Justin Walsh, but he's one of the biggest accounts on LinkedIn. <laughs> and he talks a lot about basically doing more of what he loves, less of what he hates. And, you know, spending time with his family, reading a book at two o'clock in the afternoon, if that's what suits him and yada, yada, yada. And I guess like I, before I ask you guys what you think about this notion of like controlling your own time and the opportunity maybe to streamline our work so that we can actually live more of our lives, you know, whether he's romanticizing it or not, I do believe it's possible. I just think it's really difficult. And I don't necessarily think that we spend enough time talking about the nuance of how to actually achieve those kinds of balances. So I'm just kind of curious what you guys think about that. Cause just to go back to my original point around like not wanting to prop up the rock star social media perspective of this endeavor of being a solopreneur. Liam, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned Justin cause he's the person that was in my mind when, when I was referencing popular uh, solopreneurs, obviously he's done a very effective job at branding himself on the platform. Um, I have a funny story. I was going to launch a course four years ago and I was talking to Justin Welsh about it and he had just launched his course and I was like, dude, I'm definitely going to do this. And I didn't and he did and he is where he is and I am where I am, which I'm not complaining about, but talk about, you know, striking when the iron's hot and being kind of right place, right time, right, right way to approach the market. Um, I think that what he has done has been really interesting because it's an empowering play for him, right? I mean, he he empowers other people to have faith in themselves and understand the knowledge that they bring to any company and and think critically about whether or not that is knowledge that they could monetize themselves independently of working for a company or not. And I think that that is a valuable question to be putting out into the world because I think it is easier than a lot of people think it is um to, to do that everybody has a knowledge base everybody has creativity and personality and the world is a very large place right so there is a lot of opportunity out there for everyone i think that the the flip side and not necessarily that he doesn't say this but it is definitely not for everyone and there's nothing wrong with working for a company and wanting to work into a, in an office every day or multiple days a week that is totally fine, and it's actually what the majority of people probably do prefer to do because it's what we're conditioned to do, right? Um, solopreneurship is very lonely and very difficult and challenging, and you have to deal with you know all the negative self-talk that goes into your head. And I think Justin Welsh probably doesn't have a whole lot of that, but a lot of other people who are trying to follow the lead that he is setting are probably finding it a lot more difficult to find that balance and maintain positive thoughts and really focus on building because they're not him right like like 
it's a it's a very unique moment in time that he was able to start what he started and build the movement that he did and he did a very effective job at it but i think each individual again has to really uh yet yeah, to chris's point right it's the intersection of opportunity preparation and luck uh that's what entrepreneurship is defined as and like i think he had all of those things in spades and it just ended up launching him it's a very different environment now and i can attest to that there's a yeah. lot of competition out there yeah, for sure. And as I want to, Darcy, I want to hear your perspective on this too. And it's like, I don't necessarily think that Justin Welsh has to be the one to talk about like in a more deep way, the battle scars and maybe a lot of the negative self-talk, but I find he kind of grazes over that. He mentions it to some extent, but it's not the foundation of what he's talking about. And I think that's fine because he's trying to sell a product around the opportunity and the possibilities and getting started and all that. But I'm just wondering how we broaden that conversation a bit and make it possible for people to understand what they might be getting into or deal with some of the the negative self-talk and the emotional challenges that come with it so what's your take on all that darcy yeah i mean i love justin well she's taught me a lot about copywriting and i think he serves a very unique and specific purpose on linkedin and what he does and that, that's all i'll say about it um for me i had a friend recently say to me like oh my gosh like it looks like you just have everything together and i just wish i could be like you and i looked into her and i was like i am so viscerally uncomfortable 98 percent of the time like so uncomfortable and i think that as liam said like yeah solopreneurship isn't for everybody but if it is for you you need to be really 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 ready to be really uncomfortable all of the time and that's an important point i want to make i think another thing that is really important that you know i i realized through the remote work world is i watched behavior patterns from about 2017 to 2023 of new to remote workers because there weren't a lot i'm going to use this example in solopreneurship the number one struggle in every single person I talk to, irrespective of how senior they were in their position or how kind of confident they were, their biggest struggle was self-permission, was being able to actually like give themselves permission to do things differently in a different behavioral pattern that they had been conditioned into. And it takes about two years, this is just my qualitative analysis, it takes almost two years to assimilate into like a different type of working mindset. And so I'd like offer that it doesn't happen overnight. You're not going to be Justin Welsh tomorrow. And like, for me, it's taken so much meditation, setting myself up for every week, every day, I spend almost two hours in like meditation or breath work or yoga or journaling to just make sure that I'm coming back to like my mission and my core values and my why that really keeps me going. And then filling in the blanks of like, where am I needing more support? Or where am I feeling really lonely? Like, where could I go this week that might support, like fill that hole for me? And then I think on another vein, <laughs> I'm also a total hippie, you guys. So just <laughs> bear with me here. Um, I think also like really listening to your body. Um, I think somatic work is really important when you become a solopreneur and you start to be like, oh, maybe I got that hip hit of dopamine on LinkedIn or, oh my gosh, this client, potential client might be interested in me. Well, is that actually like what you want? Like, how does it feel in your body? How are you responding to that? Like, how does literally every single part of your body feel when you receive certain information? And I think that that's a practice that's taking me like 10 years to really learn how to like listen to my own like visceral bodily feelings. But I think that that's something that's really important that you will go through becoming a solopreneur. You know, Darcy, as you're saying all this, and I don't want to make this too like romantic, but you're really describing solopreneurship as almost like a professional athletic pursuit. And, I, and like it clearly like it is because when you think of an athlete, right? Like how much of the time are they quote unquote on the field playing or doing their thing? It's way less than all the, the training and the things that they're doing behind the scenes. And that's all work. And I think it's so great that you're saying that because a lot of people are probably getting caught up thinking like, I need to work like 12 hours a day grinding to be able to succeed at this, but it may well be that they actually need to do a things that circle around it, like stretching or diet or exercise or mindfulness or whatever. And then if they end up doing less quote unquote work, it's going to be 
better work and thus they'll succeed more over time. So I, I love that. I want to transition because I, I want to talk about personal branding and I want to talk about it in the context also of being an employee as well. So, but, but to transition, you know, the creator economy in general, it's estimated to reach $6 billion by the end of this year. And it's going to get to apparently a half a trillion dollars by 2027. This is massive growth, but it's obviously still a fraction of global economic output. But what I, what I really want to try to better understand is how, how can an employee, because to Liam's point, many people actually still want to work at a company. How can employees navigate this whole idea of having a personal brand, potentially pursuing a different revenue stream while still being employed without getting too out of sync with their employer? And like, I will call myself out in this one, just taking aside the other revenue streams, I've been very, very vocal since the pandemic on LinkedIn, creating my own personal brand. And it has not always been easy. I've actually been asked to put a disclaimer on my content by my company. And not a lot of people, I think, are willing to, you know, step into the fear that's associated with all of this. But I also don't think it's realistic to suggest that, you know, all of a sudden the whole world's going to be 7 billion people, all going to be one person companies. So how can we help? you know, people that are working at companies build their personal brands either to stay there in some capacity or bridge themselves into a future state that looks a little bit more like a Liam or a Darcy. And so Liam, I'll start with you. Like, what's your take on all this? And I know you have a lot to give on personal branding. So I want to start with you. Thanks. Yeah. So I think, you know, look, I think the, the interesting thing about um, where we are right now is that the personal brand can make it so that people have the ability to just put their hands in different honey pots. Um, I know for me personally, one of the things that has been really interesting in joining sort of or becoming a solopreneur is that a lot of the clients that I ended up working with on the personal branding front realize that I have this background in sales operations. And so they start asking me questions about, you know, tools and systems and processes and automation and using AI. And, you know, they can see that I'm talking about all these things on a regular basis, which is part of my personal brand, right? And so naturally those types of conversations end up happening and more business comes out of it as a result. So then I end up helping multiple different agencies, even if it's just, you know, one or two days a week, right. Or an hour a week. And so our personal brands really do manifest opportunity that we didn't know existed. Otherwise, um, I still honestly, am not sure if this is my long-term thing because I do really miss being around people in an environment where we are, collaborating together to build something and grow something and, you know, doing that cross collaboration across different teams. Like I miss that dance quite a bit. So um, I think that it is possible to do both. And I think that a lot of companies, I, I say that they need to start treating employees a little bit more like athletes, right? Where you have basically contracted somebody to work with you and they will be there for a certain period of time. Um, you don't necessarily know if they're going to stick around 10 years or five years or two years or whatever, but make the most of them while you have them. And that means provide them with fulfilling work so that they can do their best work for you as a company, but also encourage them to build their personal brands and start sort of sharing their knowledge with the world because it can have a downstream implication on your business and it can attract more people, uh, whether that's clients or talent, et cetera. Having people talk about what they're passionate about and what they know is one of the the best ways to attract people to your brand as a business. So I think that is what companies need to start doing more. And then you'll find that, you know, people are not going to take advantage of that necessarily. Well said. I have lots of things I'd love to say, but I want to pass the mic to Darcy. Do you, if you need me to reframe anything or prompt something new, please let me know. But if yeah. not, just give us what you got. I mean, I, I don't have too much to say on that because I think that we're just in this really muddy period that we're going to be in for the next three to five years as companies sort of reshuffle into the future of work and realize like what they want to allow and what they don't want to allow. I mean, in a lot of ways, when you're a full time employee for a company, guess what? They own you in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways, they they own a lot of your content dependent on the company and depending, depending how public that company is. And so there's a really fine line. Um, 
I am very much in alignment with Liam around the fact of like more transactional contracts, as well as I really encourage whenever I, whenever I've worked full time for a company, been on a people team or been on an ops team is how do we make this a company a great place to be from? And I think that that's the reframing that a lot of companies need to take right now. Like they shouldn't be trying to hold on to their employees forever. Look at the layoffs that have happened, really focusing on helping people with their personal brands, helping them build out their LinkedIn, because guess what? A business is a business. It's not a family. They're not going to be there forever. Anything could happen. And so I think really looking at the relationship in a much more holistic level will be really, really beneficial in the future. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love it too. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm to, to comment, Leon, on what you're saying too, and, and Darcy, same with you. Like, I agree, a company in a lot of ways does own the brand of an employee. But interestingly, coming from my own perspective, what I can say is that if you're willing to step out into the unknown, you can find a way to have a brand that speaks to different things or maybe isn't in full alignment with every aspect of what a large organization's overall client base has to say, yeah. but it, but it is difficult. You have to be willing to do that. And it, it, I actually thought about teaching a course at one point about personal branding as a corporate employee, but uh, for several reasons, I've shied away from it. But one of the main ones is just that I think that you can't really teach somebody how to do that part of it. Like they have to just decide, is that what I want to do? Or is it something that I don't want to do? Um, but I, I think for most employees, they're probably going to be either speaking about something that has nothing to do yeah. with what the company is is doing. And I, I don't see any reason why that's a problem. I guess one of the things I, I would say is like, don't like let the fact that you work at a company stop you from building a brand around something that you care about. And if your employer has a has a problem with it, I think there's there's ways to navigate that. And then Liam, to your point, you know there are these opportunities to get contract work even while you're working at a large employer. And I've had a few companies approach this approach me about this lately too. 